up, guys? Sean Campy here. Thanks for visiting my movie vlog. And it's Tuesday, so it's time for some Star Wars Talk Tuesdays, my favorite day of the week. It's time for us to talk a little bit of Star Wars here on a show that, I'm not going to lie, is pretty much exactly like the John Campia podcast that I do every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, except that it's just all Star Wars stuff that we're going to talk about today. A lot of you guys send in questions regarding Star Wars, so I thought, you know what? Why not just start one little show a week where all we do is take your Star Wars topics and questions, and that's what we're doing. How do you get a Star Wars topic or question on Star Wars Talk Tuesday? Simple. Email me anytime at the John Campia Podcast at gmail.com. That's the John Campia Podcast at gmail.com. Make sure in the subject line, this is important, in the subject line of your email, put SWTT. That's SWTT, Star Wars Talk Tuesdays. Make sure you put that in the subject line so I know that it's specifically for Star Wars Talk Tuesdays. And hey guys, I'm going to let you know too that there is an audio only version of the show. If you want to, would rather instead of watching this show, if you'd rather listen to it on your commute to work or at the gym or whatever, my Patreon supporters over on my Patreon page, we do put up audio only versions of both the John Campia podcast every day and Star Wars Talk Tuesday. But anyway, go on over to my Patreon page. I put in the link to the description and get more information there. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, it's time for us to dive into the first topic today. And the first topic today comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters, Mode Feardhouse, who writes, What do you think about Disney using the Old Republic storyline as inspiration for a new trilogy? Maybe a Revan trilogy. The Old Republic is still canon, right? Thanks for taking my question. Love the new Star Wars Tuesday. All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. And look, Old Republic is one of those areas that is still very much in confusion when it comes to what is canon, what is not canon. Once Disney bought Lucasfilm and established that everything that had come before already that wasn't television show or movies was now what they call legends. It's not actually canon anymore. Now all the new stuff, including the movies and, uh, you know, the animated series, they are canon, not uh, droids, that show, nor the Ewoks movies. Those aren't canon either, or the Christmas special. Anyway, some of them are. So anyway, once they established that, it left a lot of questions about the Old Republic. Now, we know the Old Republic is a part, and I'm not talking about specific storylines here. I'm just talking in general, broader terms. The Old Republic is a part of Star Wars history, but which stories... Which characters, which arcs, which periods of time in the Old Republic, which ones are canon and which ones aren't? The easiest answer is none of it. None of it is canon unless it starts to get mentioned in the new movies or the new TV shows. If they get mentioned there, then they're canon. There have already been a couple of elements of the Old Republic that have been mentioned in either the movies or the television properties. So those things are canon. But the vast majority of Old Republic stuff is not, at least as of yet, is not canon until Star Wars brings them into canon by introducing them in existing movies or TV shows. So that's the best way to answer it. But just because something isn't canon yet doesn't mean that it's not available to the creators to cherry pick out of the old legend stuff and make it canon. Okay, so like a good example of this is Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn was not canon, but he was available to the creators like Dave Filoni to go into the old legend stuff and say, oh, I'd like to take this, in this case, Grand Admiral Thrawn, I'm going to pluck him out and I'm going to put him in Rebels. Now he is canon. A different canon than what he was in Legends. He's a totally different character now. He doesn't have the same history or the same, you know, role to play that he does in the Heir to the Empire series, which is Legends. But he is canon now. The creators are totally free if they want to start delving into Old Republic stuff and making new things out of those characters and new things out of those time frames and doing anything they want to do. I am very interested in them exploring the Old Republic time era because I'm sick and fucking tired of everything being a rehash of things we've already seen. Yeah, look, I'm as excited about the Han Solo movies as anybody. I would have rather seen something else, but I'm excited for Han Solo because it's Han Solo. I'm excited for the Obi-Wan movie. I am. I'm excited for it because it's Obi-Wan. But I would have rather them see them doing something new or different. 
I'm not excited about the idea of a Boba Fett movie. I'm not excited about the idea of a, of a Job of the Hutt movie. I'm not excited about the idea of a Yoda movie. I'm not excited about an idea about an Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru prequel. I'm not excited about any of that. I mean, if they make them, they're Star Wars. So I'll go out and see them and be pumped to see them, sure. But I would rather them start to explore new stuff. And I think Old Republic is a rich playground that they can do anything they want with. And they don't have to follow the old stories. They can do whatever they want with it. Cherry pick out your favorite characters. Cherry pick out your favorite stories and make those canon. I would really, really like to see that happen. So would I like to see them do it? Absolutely. I would much rather see them do that than to make a I don't know, a TC-14 movie, you know? Anyway. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from another Patreon supporter of mine, <clears throat> Kyle Beckworth, who writes, Hi, John. With all the Warner Brothers slash DCEU talk, what about movies will or will not... Sorry, let me phrase that again. About what movies will or will not be in the cinematic universe? Got me thinking about Star Wars canon. Do you think that Lucasfilm would ever make a non-canon standalone film? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Kyle. Sorry that I butchered reading it so badly. So basically what he's referring to is recently it got announced that the DCEU and Warner Brothers is looking at doing a standalone Joker film produced by Martin Scorsese that would be set outside of the DCEU, like not a part of the DCEU. It would not be Jared Leto's Joker. It's going to be a Joker set in the early 1980s, completely standalone one-shot movie, okay? So that would be a totally different universe and a totally different Joker than the one that we've got going today because, of course, Jared Leto's Joker would have been like five or ten years old in the early 1980s, so there's no point in doing that there. So with a lot of talk, and then there were some questions about whether the Batman movie was going to be separate or in the DCEU because director uh, Matt Reeves made some very confusing comments. He caused a lot of confusion. He then later clarified his comments. Batman isn't the DCEU, but it's got a lot of people talking about the possibility of telling some standalone stories. So what Kyle is asking here is a very interesting question. Could we see Disney? Could we see Lucasfilm maybe try? a Darth Vader movie, an elsewhere, an Elseworld Darth Vader movie, where Darth Vader, I don't know, shoots down Luke Skywalker and prevents the destruction of the first Death Star. And now it's a standalone Darth Vader movie crushing the rest of the resistance in the universe. Could we see that? Could we see a standalone movie where Obi-Wan Kenobi was actually around 500 years ago and some of his adventures from 500 years ago instead of the time frame that he was born in. Could we see some Star Wars movies that are completely disassociated and disconnected from the storylines of Star Wars and sit outside of canon and make their own standalone movies? Could that happen? Well, it does present some very interesting possibilities. I already referenced the Heir to the Empire trilogy, the, the Grand Admiral Thrawn trilogy. Those would make some amazing movies. I mean, but you can't do them. For any of you who have read the Heir to the Empire trilogy, you know you can't do them now because they're completely inconsistent and contradict what's going on in the movies. The events of The Force Awakens are completely contradicted by what's going on in the Heir to the Empire books that were written so many decades ago. So you can't do that in current Star Wars canon. What about the idea of making, okay, then let's make some movies that aren't canon. It does create some interesting possibilities, but I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no on both levels. But level number one, I don't think it's something Disney or Lucasfilm would ever do. No on the level of it's not something I think I would want them to do. While it does present some really interesting possibilities, sure, would I really want them to start mucking around like that and disrupting their canon? I don't think so. It would be different. I might have a different opinion if they were making three or four Star Wars movies a year. If you're doing three or four Star Wars movies a year, then maybe I might be interested in some standalone one-shot Elseworld kind of Star Wars stories that stand outside of those storylines. But right now, it seems like Lucasfilm and their plan with Disney is to make one movie a year. 
and one chapter a year in the grand Star Wars story, not counting animated shows and whatnot, but one story a year, that doesn't feel to me like you need to tell extra canon stories, especially when there's so much you can do in canon. Like we were just talking about Old Republic. The worlds, the universes are open to Lucasfilm and Disney to telling whatever kind of story they want because the universe is so big and the time period of Star Wars spans millennia, spans thousands of years. So Star Wars, Lucasfilm and Disney right now, they are free to tell any kind of story they really want to tell and still say it falls in canon. Because, oh yeah, th but this happened in a in, on a planet that's way in the Outer Rim. Or they can say, this story happened in, you know, 2000 BBY, before the Battle of Yavin. So it happens 2000 BBY. It's like, you can tell any kind of story with almost any kind of character you want and still say it's a part of canon without it disrupting the main storylines. So for those reasons and a few others... It is a curious idea. It's a, it's an interesting idea. I can totally see why you'd bring it up. But honestly, I just don't see why they would do it. I don't think they have any inclination to do it. And most importantly, they don't have a need to do it because of the sheer size and vastness of the Star Wars galaxy. Anyway, great question. Who knows? Maybe they will someday, but I just don't think they should or will. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, Kyle. The next question today comes to us from yet another one of my Patreon supporters, Tim Stratford, who writes... Hi, John. Thanks for doing a Star Wars focus show each week. Believe me, the pleasure is mine. I love talking Star Wars. In April, at Star Wars Celebration, Dave Filoni announced that Lucasfilm was already working on a new animated series to replace Rebels after its fourth season and last season. I think the series will be set between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, and will feature Luke, voiced by Mark Hamill, in some way. Yeah, so back in April... In Orlando, I was very fortunate enough to actually be at Star Wars Celebration this year. It was a hell of a lot of fun. Got to meet thousands of fans, which was unbelievable. If you were one of the people down there and you were one of the people who came up and talked to me, thank you so much. You made that seriously one of the best experiences I've ever had at Star Wars Celebration that year, thanks to you. So anyway, um, Dave Filoni announced that that's when they made it official that the upcoming Rebel Season 4 was going to be the final season because they're running out of time, how much time there is between the events of Rebels and the events of Rogue One. So they're ending off the series, but he said they've got something else in store. They got something else in mind. Now, we've got uh, Tim here who is suggesting that maybe the new series could happen in the time period between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. There is a lot of time. You got like a 30-year yeah, I'll say about 30-year time period between the events, is, the events of Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. There's a lot in there. There's a lot there you could explore and play around in. You know, the organization of the New Republic, the secret coming together of the First Order before they emerged themselves and revealed themselves to the rest of the universe. There's a lot the the struggles of Princess Leia that we see in the novel Bloodline by Claudia Gray which is a magnificent book, by the way, you should read it if you get a chance, called Bloodline. Anyway, so there's a lot that goes on in there. Is it my first choice? I don't know that it would be my first choice. I think my favorite period, like everybody knows I play the Star Wars role-playing game. I play a lot of Star Wars role-playing games, okay? I'm an old school tabletop D6. Actually, I could pull out my books here. You know what? I am. I'm going to do that. Give me a second. Forgive me. da 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 Okay, I'm back. I'm back. All right. So, uh, everybody knows I like to play a lot of role playing games. Uh, here is my uh, the core rule book for Star Wars, uh, the role playing game that I like to play. I got a few. Uh, there are a few character sheets in here. A lot of character sheets, different types. Got all my dice. Got my dice in here. Got my pens and my paper over there. Um, now, when I play Star Wars role-playing games, at least the group that I used to play with, we almost always, I'd say 98 times out of 100, we would play in the era between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. It just seems to be a great playground for telling Star Wars stories. And so when we would play a role-playing game, we would play in there. Since that's what I'm most familiar with, I think I would be really intrigued 
to see a new animated series taking place in there. Okay, think about the, the state of political unrest in the galaxy at that point. Because you're still living in a period of time where the galaxy has seen that the Empire is not, you know, invulnerable. They're not all powerful. The first Death Star was destroyed just a few years ago, right? There was a big victory about it. The rebels are a real serious thing. Yet, they are at a pinnacle of power still because they're coming off the events of Return of the Je or Empire Strikes Back where they dealt a serious blow to the rebellion. So they're on the uptick and they're in the process of building yet another battle station, another Star Destroyer. That period of time, I think is a really rich, fun period of time in the Star Wars galaxy. Now you can make a very valid argument about John, there've been a lot of stories told in that era. I'm not disagreeing with you. I actually agree with you. However, I think that's just a testament to how cool that time period is. Now, so I would, obviously, I would love to see the new show set in between Empire and Return of the Jedi. I would also, we were talking a little bit before about Old Republic. I would love to see maybe something set in the Old Republic. I think that would be really good. But yeah, like I said, between the Return of the Jedi and the, and the Force Awakens, there is a big period of time, lots of possibilities there. I'm open just about everything. I don't think you're going to see Mark Hamill involved. Um, I, I don't say that with firsthand knowledge. I'm simply saying I don't think he's going to be involved. So I would doubt that, but it would be kind of cool. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on now to the next question. And the next topic today comes to us from Chris. And Chris writes, Hi, John. I, much like other longtime fans, am craving content set in, here it is again, the Old Republic. Whilst I am not too bothered about the format of release, be it movies, TV, etc., I am quite interested in the characters that might be taken from the extended universe, also known now as Legends. I personally love Exar Kun, but think Nihilus would be revolutionary as the Dark Lord of the Sith. Do you have any favorite characters from this era? And would you like to see anything done in particular? Um, thanks a lot for the question. Again, Old Republic incredibly rich area, big playground. Not only is there a lot of existing characters and stories, the Star Wars filmmakers and storytellers can do anything they want with it. They can make up something totally new, which is great. There is one character in the Old Republic, set in that era-ish, that I have always been attracted to, that I am always like really keen on hearing new stories about, and it's Jedi Grandmaster Satil. And Satil was a character that I first got introduced to in the trailer for The Old Republic, for the video game, The Old Republic. Remember that great one where the Jedi Master and his little Padawan and the Padawan was Satil. They're arresting some kind of smuggler. And then all of a sudden the Sith reemerge and they land on their ship. They board the ship and there's this huge lightsaber battle and Satil escapes. Anyway, that's where I was first introduced to Satil. They've done a lot of really good work with her backstory. So... Satil comes from the line of Revan. In again, this is not official canon, but in the extended universe and in Legends, she comes from the line. She's a direct descendant of Revan. And at any rate, she becomes this great Jedi master. She ultimately becomes the Grand Master of the Jedi Knight, which is no longer a title I think the Jedi's used by the time we got to Star Wars or, or uh, should I say, The Phantom Menace. I don't think the uh, Star Wars universe utilized or the Jedi Order used the term Grandmaster, but she was the Grandmaster. She reestablished the Jedi Temple on Typhoon. She did uh, Typhoon or Typhoid. I, I always mispronounce the name of the planet. Anyway, she reestablished the Jedi Temple there. Ultimately, she even worked out an alliance with the Sith once to fight a common enemy. And then at the end of the day, she kind of exiled herself. She stepped down, exiled herself. And I think that's the end of her story. Anyway, to me, she is a fascinating character. I am completely enthralled with this character. I would love to see a story based on her. So yeah, if they did ever do something with Old Republic and, you know, Kathleen Kennedy or Pablo Hidalgo got on the phone with me and said, hey, Campia, everybody over here at Lucasfilm, just, they don't feel like they can do anything till they hear from you. Which story should we tell? This is obviously a fantasy of mine. It would never happen. But there you go. They're on the phone with me. Which movie should we do? Man, I'm telling you, Satil. Satil, Satil, Satil. And it seems like lately Lucasfilm has really been getting into telling female-based stories as well. Um, 
So we're, and then you start talking about the animated series as well. That's really female character focus, the uh, De- forces of destiny. And I think Satil would be a great addition to that. Just fantastic. Look into Satil if you haven't had a chance to yet. All right. Let's move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paul Reaper. And Paul Reaper writes, Hey, John, loving the new channel. Thank you so much. My question is relating to the upcoming Obi-Wan standalone movie. Does Ewan McGregor's absence from Star Wars Celebration 40th anniversary put his casting as Obi-Wan in doubt or was it purely a scheduling issue? Thanks a lot for the question, Chris or uh, Paul. Look, I'll be honest with you. If I had $100 to bet, I would put $100 down that Ewan McGregor will be Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay? I feel pretty confident about that as a fan. I I don't have any insider information. I'm just saying as a fan, I feel pretty good that he's going to end up being Obi-Wan. However, you raise a really interesting point. Because a Star Wars celebration, not only was practically everybody there, even Hayden Christensen was there, even Dennis Lawson who had like kind of like his relationship with Star Wars has been on the outs for a lot of years. Even Dennis Lawson was there. And then the very few Star Wars people who weren't there at least sent in these video messages, like even Liam Neeson. He sent in a video message that they played on the big screens for the audience at Celebration. I mean, and a number of people did that. Incredibly conspicuous by his absence was Obi-Wan. It was Hugh McGregor. He wasn't there physically and he didn't send in when like everybody else, at least even Samuel L. Jackson, even Sam Jackson sent in a video greeting that they played on the big screens for everybody at the event. And yet, no Ewan McGregor. No Ewan McGregor. I mean, there was also no... um, uh, no, no, Padme. She wasn't there either. So, but, but nobody expected her there or cared, I guess. But Ewan McGregor wasn't there and no video message, and they didn't even mention him. They didn't mention him. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you, I heard there were a lot of conversations once that presentation was done and people were standing around there. I was involved in a couple of conversations. I overheard other conversations like, what gives? Why why no Ewan McGregor? Now, it is nine out of 10 chance that it's a completely innocent thing. Like it was just scheduling. He just couldn't be there. And maybe he tried to record a video message and it didn't work or something got messed up or whatever. It's 90% chance that that's the case. Okay. That is 90% of the chance. And that's what probably it is. And I would put a hundred bucks on him playing Obi-Wan, but you are not wrong to question that. Like how does a report about an Obi-Wan movie come out and not include something like you McGregor would be circled to play the role? Why not mention that? Why have this big Star Wars event just a few months earlier and not have you McGregor there or at least have him send in a video greeting when everybody else did? It is interesting and concerning, sure. Again, I still think it's a 90% chance it's nothing. But if they announce tomorrow that you McGregor is not going to be a part of anything Star Wars moving forward, I wouldn't fall out of my chair in shock. Like I said, I would put money on him coming back, but I wouldn't die of shock if they announced he wasn't, just because these are some pretty weird circumstances. But I think we're fine. I I wouldn't panic. I think we're fine. I think he will end up being Obi-Wan. But yeah, like I'm saying, dude, you're not wrong. You bring up something that was a real hot topic in Orlando. Where the hell was Ewan McGregor? So anyway, let's move on now to the final questions of the day. I don't want to end. You know what? I I only picked out six questions. Moving forward, I'm going to pick out more than six questions for Star Wars Talk Tuesday, okay? Anyway. But the last question I have picked out today comes to us from Kyle White. And Kyle White writes, Since the release of The Force Awakens, there are a lot of people out there who have classified Rey as a Mary Sue. People complain that she mastered everything too quickly and that she was able to defeat Kylo Ren, a trained Force user, in combat. I was curious as to what your thoughts are on those who argue that she is a Mary Sue. Thanks and keep up the great work. This is an argument that has driven me crazy. Absolutely crazy. If you think that Rey was portrayed as some sort of too perfect in The Force Awakens, I'm sorry, then you just weren't paying very close attention. She's naive. She um, is irrational on a number of occasions. 
She is like way too trusting sometimes. She asks some really silly questions. I mean, she's beyond, beyond, like far beyond. She's a flawed character. Not super flawed. She's not like Han Solo scoundrel flawed, but she is a flawed character. Now, most of her flaws fall on the nice side. She's a nice girl. Yes, absolutely. She's a nice girl. But to think that she's all wise, all knowing, whatever, is, is that just tells me you weren't paying attention to the movie. There are a number of scenes that she gets herself and potentially other people in trouble just because she's so naive um, and gullible and things like that a number of times. The other thing that really gets me, though, is this whole complaint about how could she possibly fight Kylo Ren? Two huge factors, okay? Two huge factors. Has Rey ever held a lightsaber before? I still think her staff is secretly a lightsaber, but let's not talk about that right now. Okay. Has she ever held a lightsaber? Officially, no. But what we do know from The Force Awakens and certain scenes in The Force Awakens is that she has been fighting to survive her whole life. Her whole life has been fighting for survival. And she's got that staff. And clearly, she has been fighting with that staff for years. She has clearly been fighting for years in melee combat. She knows melee combat. All right? We saw her take out those dudes at the beginning pretty easily. And the principles of fighting with a staff, not that different from fighting with a stick. And I'm sure she's fought with a lot of sticks, whether they're gaffy sticks or any other type of weapon, like handheld melee weapon. She's done it. She's used it. So it's not like she's never touched a weapon before, okay? Keep that in mind. Now, is that enough to say that she be, should be able to go toe-to-toe with Kylo Ren? On its own, no. But here's the second huge thing that everybody just freaking overlooks. Kylo Ren, while fighting Finn and Rey, was literally bleeding out and dying on his feet. There are a couple of scenes in The Force Awakens where the director, J.J. Abrams, made a point to show us just how powerful Chewie's crossbow is. His bowcaster is crazy powerful. And we saw a couple of times where somebody would get shot with the bowcaster and it would send them flying 50 feet, so much so that even Han Solo goes, I like this thing. Like, that's how powerful that bowcaster is. Kylo Ren took one square in the gut. He got hit with a bowcaster shot that was blowing other people 50 feet and sending their bodies flying after they got shot with it. That's what he got hit with. Now, yeah, he was still standing, but I'm telling you right now, he was bleeding out and he was dying. He was crazy injured. I mean, he was still leaving a trail of blood after leaving the bunker and trying to follow out Ray and Finn out into the woods because remember, they saw his trail of blood. And he's like, he's he's about to die. And he's like hitting himself and like trying to get himself, whatever. He was not at 100%. Kylo Ren, I doubt he was at 50% at that point. He was literally maybe an hour away from bleeding out and dying there in the snow and probably would have if it wasn't for the general coming out to get him because Snoke sent him for him. But anyway, so there are two things to keep in mind. Number one, he was dying He was probably at less than 50%. It was probably taking everything he had just to stay conscious. And on top of that, he was fighting somebody who is not a stranger to melee combat, to physical weapon on weapon, physical weapon on physical weapon combat, who's been fighting for survival her entire life. You put those two things together on top of the force is clearly, it's been dormant, but it's very, very strong with her. You couple him dying with the fact that she's been fighting for survival her whole life, and now she's just tapping into the Force, and the Force is now flowing through her in a way that has maybe never done so in another person before. You put all three of those things together, it is not unrealistic to expect her to win that fight. It's not unrealistic. It's actually quite realistic. And before fighting her, she was fighting a trained warrior stormtrooper in Finn. Now, he beat Finn. But again, he was fighting a guy who's been trained since birth in combat. Again, he was bleeding out and he was dying and he's fighting another guy. So he had that fight with Finn first and he got more injured in that fight and then he had to fight Ray. So this whole, I swear to God, all film is subjective. But every time I hear anybody crying and complaining about, oh, she should have been able to fight, you know, Kylo Ren, then I say, then you weren't paying attention to the movie. 
You simply were not paying attention. Because if you were paying attention, you wouldn't be saying that. Anyway, I, I clearly get a little bit worked up on this issue. But anyway, guys, that runs out my time for today. Thank you so much for joining me for Star Wars Talk Tuesday. I'll be doing this again next week, obviously. Again, just send in your questions to the John KB Podcast at gmail.com. And make sure you put SWTT in the subject line. That way I know you're sending a question in for Star Wars Talk Tuesday. Uh, once again, if you want an audio-only version of this, become one of my Patreon supporters. While you're here, guys, click the subscribe button. Become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. And make sure you're following me on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. I love Star Wars Talk Tuesdays. That'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. And until next time, bye bye